All right, let's stand. And you are my champion. Giants fall when you stand on the feet. Every battle you've won, and I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence, I'm seated in the heavenly place on the feet. With the one who has conquered it all And I've tried so hard to see it It took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve, and you take the broken thing and raise it to glory. You are my champion. The giants fall.
Well, you don't have trouble finding a place to sit. That's what I was just saying. Good evening. <laughs> One thing I learned from last Wednesday of Serena tells you that a bad storm's coming through. A bad storm's coming through. Pay attention to her. Don't listen to me. Um... Let's pray. Patricia, you want to pray for us? Amen. Last week we didn't do Galatians because um, the viewer. And then tonight I shouldn't be doing Galatians because people are still trying to survive. We just got our power back last night about 8.30. And I realized uh, today as I was in the Word how tired I was from just um, having to navigate life. You know, when a, for Livia, who's a much braver person than I am in all areas, but when it's like a person when they're handicapped and things change, one of the ways they make life work is by routine. If you have a person who's blind and you change some things around their home, you don't tell them about it, but it's very difficult. And the same thing's true for somebody who can't walk and to transfer and do all those kind of things and so when you have a handicapped bathroom and all that stuff and so when you lose power and we don't have city water so we don't we have wells so when the power goes out water goes out so trying to fill tanks up so you can flush toilets and measuring how many toilets you can flush a day so you don't have to make too many trips to the swimming pool <laughs> to get water and um and just the whole making it work is, is this harder. And uh, so you don't sleep as much and you just deal with stuff. It's just different. And then it's out of my element. I'm not um, dealing with things like generators, like George and John, and he brought a generator, but generators and trees and anything mechanical or whatever, that's just not my world. And so it's out of my element. So all the phone calls, trying to talk to people, not it's just bizarre interesting time and um, the uh, uh, so I'm grateful we, God really provided for us so many people that just helped I mentioned George and Ron was there at the house helping because he does know that world better than I do and can answer ask questions and answer questions and then I'm still having to recover hearing because that generators are so loud so just I'm not used to there not being that noise in the background and then um, we had, we discovered that when, so I'll tell you a fun story, I may tell it again Sunday, but when, um, and also I'm stalling for Tom because I've got Galatians prepared, but I kind of, there's a part of me that wants to wait so when we have actually more than six people. Um, <laughs> but um, we couldn't, You know, as, as power was kind of come back on, Livia has been on a year on a list called life support list because of her oxygen. So if the power goes out, but she's sort of our house is a priority that they try to tr get it on quickly because, as much as they can so that she doesn't have trouble. But so, but this one was going on and on. And um, so Greg Clemens, who worked for the power company, retired like in April. He was kind of the person who, I was just saying, Greg, what should we, what do we do? If 
but Greg's calling and trying to call in favors from people that he knew he worked with and trying to see if he can encourage people to do things. And in the end, we discovered that likely that uh, our, uh, when the people who contract with the power company, the people who cut the trees, pipe, they first came out and did the evaluation the first day, that for whatever reason, they never put the order in. So even though our hill eventually got some power, uh, the storm that hit us, the trees that hit us, pulled our whole wiring that goes in the house, out of the house. And so they had to, that had to be fixed by electricians. So it was a long, long story. But in the end, um, <laughs> it's good to be married to somebody who has had years of impact and spiritual influence. And so in the end, um, a whole gaggle of people came out because they got a phone call from one of the vice presidents of the power company because the chief justice of the Supreme Court gave him a call and said, we need to get the power on and get it on for this, this friend of mine, Livia, not Chucky, Livia. And we're friends, but Livia's the real friend. <laughs> and then they discovered that the order wasn't even in. And so they, uh, it, so I, one of them came in the house, the guy who's head of the crew, check out some circuit breakers and, I said, let me take you back here and let you introduce you to the real person of influence and authority. And he said, whoever she is, she's really got, does have some influence. So he went back and met Livia. So that's, that's our story. So we, it took him, um, while my poor son, the lawyer, still didn't have power. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Well, let's just um, let's just do what we plan. So we're in Galatians chapter five, okay? As I mentioned before, let's pray. How about that? Oh, we already prayed. Let your sister. That was John's time. And um, the uh, I've taught many things from Galatians, as I mentioned when we started the book. I've never taught verse by verse through Galatians. All the years I've taught stuff, I've never done that. It's been a fascinating journey for me because it'll, more than any other thing I've ever read in the scripture, Paul just like, it's like this one note. that He just keeps singing the same note over and over again. And basically the note is the, what is the gospel? And his concern was that the Galatians were moving away from the gospel. Because the gospel is Jesus and his finished work plus nothing. And he just hammers that home again and again and again. And what happened in the, with, again, with the, the Galatians, in the, and again, you know, the scriptures are written for us. We may call it something different, but it's still the same thing. The Judaizers were actually not mean or horrible people. They were Christians. But they were concerned. They had a problem with the whole thing about Jesus plus nothing the finished work of Christ, the grace of God, that somehow people would become lazy and wouldn't, they would compromise and not go after a life of holiness. And therefore, you had to have some written restrictions or do's and don'ts. You had to come back under the law. There had to be things you had to do that you could measure to find acceptance before God and to produce a life of holiness. And Paul's argument is, is that it's not by law. We are to walk in holiness. And God wants us to feel accepted before him, but it's not by law. It's not by anything that you do in performance. It's by a life. And that because of our union with Christ, that we uh, have his acceptance before the Father and by the Holy Spirit, his very righteousness or holy life is produced through us. And so it's a life and not a law. It's easy to fall into perfection, to legalism, to um, living under performance, because it is something you can measure. The problem is, is that when you measure your performance, like you feel good about the way you're doing certain things, and therefore... You know that you have acceptance before God because he should be pleased with you because you're pretty pleased with yourself and that you believe you're producing a righteous life by the things that you're doing. 
um, that the problem is is that when you don't get it right, or you didn't get it as good as you've been doing it, or you didn't do it as long as you did before, or didn't do it as hard as you did before, then the enemy comes and attacks and says, well, you've got to work harder now to find that place of acceptance again. You've got to do more. You've got to make more promises to God of what you'll do so that you can produce a life of righteousness. So Galatians just talks about that. It's like, how do we have a righteous standing before God, and how do we live and produce a life of righteousness? Is it law, or is it by a life? And Paul is saying, I risk everything on the fact that the gospel is about my attachment to a life. And in that life, I can rest in his righteousness before the Father. And by that life, righteous living can be produced through me. All that worked out by the Holy Spirit. That's the whole story of Galatians. And Paul hits it again and again. Sometimes you say, well, gosh, why does the bishop say these things again and again? Because the Bible does. Why does he say those things from trying to come from different angles? Because Paul did. It is the dominant, not even close, massive dominant theme of the New Testament because it is the gospel. And so when you get into chapter 5, as he sort of gives some practical stuff, and again, I had some notes, but honest to goodness, I'm too tired, or my mind is too tired to try to do that, so we're just going to do this. And so whatever progress we make, that's good. What progress we don't make, we'll pick her up next week. How about that? So let me just begin in verse 1, reading from chapter 5. But that's not where we're going to, we've taught that. We're going to just give you the context again. Um, so hang in there, because I'm going to read this chapter. It says, it was for freedom's sake that Christ set us free. Now let me just establish this one thing. What's the freedom again? The freedom from a life of self-effort to try to find acceptance and to produce a life of holiness before God. Galatians, I mean, Romans 6, 10 and 11, for the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life that he lives, he's living to God. Even so, consider yourself dead to sin, but living to God because you're in Christ, only by your attachment to his life. It was for freedom's sake that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not again be subject to the yoke of slavery of performance-based Christianity. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit for you. Um, and I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. And you have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting or expecting the righteousness, the hope of righteousness. So Paul's not saying you lose your salvation. He's saying you've been attached to a life that provides your acceptance, unconditional acceptance before God. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. And by that life, you're able to live a life of holiness by his life. But if you are trying to do this by circumcision or adding any other performance thing to your walk with the Lord, you know, we read that little example last week about the lady who said that the worst day she ever had in her life, she told her pastor, was a week ago because she missed her quiet time. So he called it the law of quiet time. Is that if you treat prayer like a law, that I've got to do this to find acceptance before God, I've got to do this so I'll be, I'll be holier, then you've missed the whole point. You're, you're no longer depending on a life you're now depending on your performance. And therefore, you're severed. You're not drawing from the life that you've been attached to. He says, but the way we walk, we live by the Spirit through faith. That's how we walk, that we can experience righteous living by the Holy Spirit, and our job is to live by faith, trust. For in Christ, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, for faith, but faith working through love. You who are running well, you were walking in the gospel. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you, because a little leaven leavens a whole lump. You start giving into a little performance, and then you're going to be um, in trouble. He said, I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view than the gospel that he had shared with him. But the one who is disturbing you 
you shall bear, he shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In other words, if I'm, I'm not teaching you have to add anything to the cross. And said, so, because if I were, if, it, if I were teaching more, people wouldn't keep hating me. But they hate me and try to persecute me because I teach the cross. He goes on, he says, um, but I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Thus, then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Would that those who are troubling you would even cut themselves off. Anyway. Now, Paul, this is one of the really powerful statements in the whole book when he says, then the stumbling block, or the word there is the word we get scandal from. Then the scandal of the cross hmm, would, no, would, would have been abolished. Paul said, I get in trouble with people like these Judaizers, performance-based Christians, and because who, who want to connect themselves to the Jewish law, to the, to the Jewish prince, you know, ceremonial law and all that kind of stuff to do so you can be spiritual and not be more spiritual. He said, they persecute me because they can't stand the scandal of the cross. And the scandal of the cross is, Jesus said, Tetelestai, it is perfect. I've done everything necessary, everything necessary, for you to find unconditional acceptance before the Father because you're the righteousness of God in Christ. And because you're in Christ, you have what's necessary to live the life of a new creation, the life of righteousness and holiness. You know, thus, the book I'm writing, you know, in Christ, God's answer for broken humanity. That's the cross. What did the cross do? Crucified the old that couldn't live a godly life, that didn't have acceptance before God because they were guilty of their sin. The old was crucified, the new was raised up in him. You now have the acceptance of Jesus before the Father. You participate in his relationship with the Father, and you get to experience his life of righteousness by the Holy Spirit miraculously and supernaturally being lived out through you. One of the key verses in the scripture, in this section of scripture, he talks about, in verse 19, the deeds of the flesh. But he later talks about the fruit of the Spirit. There's a big difference between deeds and fruit. Deeds are the result of a person's own effort. Fruit is the result of you being connected as branch of the vine and something being produced in you and on you not by you. Branches are not fruit producers. Branches are fruit bearers. So it's one of the key phrases, difference here, is the difference between deeds and fruit. We'll see that more in just a minute. In verse 13, for you were called to freedom. We talked about that a little bit last week. There's one thing that every Christian shares in common in terms of what their calling is before God. I'll tell you what, one of the things you're calling is is, that, is to freedom. That you live in the freedom of experiencing Christ as your life and his acceptance before the Father and his ability to live a life of righteousness. That's freedom. Freedom from fallen self-effort, even sincere. The Judaizers were very sincere. The problem was is that when you, when you try to put people under law, under performance, um, you're sincerely trying to get them to perform, to be more righteous, to be holy, because you really think it's going to require all that, but you also use the do's and don'ts to control them and condemn them and to manipulate them. So all we, in churches, wherever there's that kind of thing, it's really a spirit of witchcraft where the law leads to people, pastors who are under the law, teachers under the law, produce Christians who are under the law, and they control them by holding them accountable to the, their own list of do's and don'ts. The risk that Paul invites us to is the risk um, where he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And then he adds that same verse. And against such things there is no law. Paul said, I dare you to believe the scandal of the cross. That if you'll simply abide in Christ, 
all this stuff, this fruit of the Spirit will come forth, and therefore, why would any law be necessary? Why would I need to put more regulation on you? Why would I need to put more do's and don'ts on you, performance stuff on you? Why would I want to manipulate you, make you feel guilty if love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control is coming forth out of your life as fruit? So that's the daring, uh, what seems like a risk to people who don't get it. That's the daring wonder of the gospel is my attachment to a life that by simply depending on that life, abiding in that life, I'll walk in holiness. And it'll be the holiness of God. Instead of putting yoke of slavery on people again and saying, no, no, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to add that, and then we can measure your holiness by are you doing those things? Are you performing those things? Okay? That's the wonder of the gospel. That's the great dare of grace. Who says in verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brethren, only, now this is, now he's going to address the Judaizers' concern. If you walk in this freedom, if you know that you have acceptance, the acceptance of Jesus before the Father without having to do anything, it was accomplished for you at the cross. And that you can't produce holiness on your own by adding any kind of requirement or law. It's by a life. And there are just things that life does and that life doesn't do. You say, well, the person just has freedom. They're going to become a drunk. No, they're not. Not if you really trust that life. Because Jesus is not a drunk. Jesus is not immoral. That's much better than law. Because law will go, well, you know what? I, I can do this much, but I'm not really a drunk. Well, whose definition of a drunk? Or whose definition of immoral? Whose definition of what? Like, I'm going to keep pushing the boundaries, and so I just have this legalistic perspective. But what is Christ? How far away would Jesus stay from those kind of things? You know what I'm saying? There's a great gap. Life. It's the righteousness, he says it in Galatians 3, the righteousness of life. He said, if the law could produce the righteousness of life, it would have done it. But righteousness is a life. And daring to believe that that life, Jesus, does not, not only does it not cross lines, it's plump full of fruit that looks like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. But Paul addresses this now, the Judaizers that's been scaring them, saying, hey, this freedom word is not so good because what if you just start doing stuff, you know, and yada, yada. So Paul says, you have been called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. In other words, he's going to, in the verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You keep your finger there. And um, I'll show you in Romans 13. Verse 8 of Romans 13. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor, who loves his neighbor, has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if any there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this simple saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. And so in Galatians, when Paul makes the statement, and he's addressing, look, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Don't be deceived by the enemy, because that can happen. He says, but if you want to sum up what the righteous life of Christ is going to look like, it's going to be loving your neighbor as yourself. 
Because when you're walking in love, which is the highest expression of the life of Christ, then you fulfill the whole law anyway. You can't add anything to that. Now, he goes beyond that in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, and all those other things. He said, look, if you're walking in love, you're laying down your life for one another. He says in verse 13, don't give it opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Through servant love is the highest expression of righteousness. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbors yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you are consumed by one another. Who bites and devours one another? People who are living a life of self-righteousness. Who think they're more righteous because they're not doing certain things or they are doing more of certain things and so they bite and devour each other. When we walk in self-righteousness, we have a tendency to see see people through critical eyes. You ever notice that? We have a tendency to put people in their, their own heart to judge them and to condemn them because we're measuring them by the measuring stick of the things that we're... See, God's going to say some things to us. Like, you know, we're doing prayer. You know, I'm going to tell everybody as we get more and more towards the end of our stuff on prayer. Look, I'm not going to tell you how long to pray. I'm not going to tell you how long I pray. Because if I do, you're going to try to follow me. You're attached to a life. He knows you. He knows your personality. The thing I will say is try to do something that's sustainable and that's consistent. Because it just bears cool fruit in your life. And I want you to be motivated by the Spirit, not out of guilt and shame. But the tendency we get into is that when God shows us certain things, do this, do this, do this, and the, just part of our walk with him is that this will work for you, Chuck. You know, you need to pray from whatever to whatever, or you need to, you know, whatever. And then we put it on other people because we think they're not doing what I'm doing. You with me? And it's, we can fall into it so easy. I watched it happen with people who really have part of their giftings is ser- in serving is to do some of the things like Pat's done for years and Edith has done like for a millennial and cleaning stuff up and that kind of thing. And I've watched them do those things as acts of worship. You know, they've never like waited until I was watching or somebody else was watching so that I would say, how wonderful you are. But I've watched people over the years, sometimes people who are very, they're serving and they'll serve stuff, but then they gripe and complain because other people don't help or don't do it the way they do it or don't see it the way they see it. They don't want to, they don't pick people up like they think they should pick them up and carry them places or do that and the other. Well, you know what? Maybe somebody is missing it, but God's got to show them. What we can't do is to wherever God's leading us in our walk with Christ, we can't then put that on other people. Some of that's because we have different ministry gifts. Amen? But when you're biting and devouring one another is one of the signs, if you find that you get critical easily of other people, and all of us fight this because this is part of the deal, right? You find yourself getting judging and being critical, it's because at some place you're walking in self-righteousness. And that's evidence that you're not being more spiritual than they are. It's actually evidence that you're less spiritual than they are. (laughs) He says, verse 15 again, but if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. But I say, here's the deal. He says, I say, Walk in or by the Spirit. In other words, the word walk by the Spirit or walk in the Spirit means walk allowing the Holy Spirit to do it. Walk in a super, live by the Spirit, supernatural, because it's the Holy Spirit that makes my union with Christ real. Amen? The Holy Spirit's come to do what? Emphasize Jesus. Glorify Jesus. John chapter 16. And he said, here's the thing. I say, walk in the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Now, we use this scripture, we referenced this last week some, we did sort of a a non-Galatians word um, about abiding. And the language that the Holy Spirit uses here is really particular. It's like one step at a time. Christianity's lived that way. 
you know, I, we did that last Wednesday night, and it was amazing how, you know, I talked about lecture lab. I mean, I left here with the lecture, having given the lecture, and then for the next six days, buddy, I was in the lab. Because every minute I'm out of my, you know, I, again, like I said earlier, I was so grateful for people like George and Ron, because I don't even know what questions, I don't know, not only do I know the answers to those, that world at all, I don't even know the questions. I mean, the questions come out stupid, you know? And Ron can carry on a conversation with the people from Alabama Power, and they can talk about electrical, the impulse, and yada, yada. I'm just like going, you know, I'm still amazed that you can flip a switch and you have power, and you need, I don't understand. And don't tell me, because at some point my eyes are going to start spinning, and my head's going to start going around in circles, because I don't know what in the world you're talking about. And so just all that goes with all that, you know, one step, one life step at a time, you abide in Christ. You know, and, and for me, I don't like to give you much language. Christianity is not something you can memorize. The truths, all of us have heard truths before. I've told you that when I talked about drawing a circle, you know, that I love vocabulary, spiritual vocabulary, because it adds to my personal walk vocabulary. And for me, it's just come down to every step, especially if I'm being challenged or there's something going on, you know, in terms of my, what I'd prefer to do, is, you know, being asked to do more, whatever, is just to remember I'm in Christ. And that means a whole lot. You know, that's a pregnant statement. That means I died to that sin. It means that Christ is my victory in this moment and, and applying that victory. It means that I'm part of his story, so it's not my story, my will. I've lost my will, I have a will. It means all that to me. And so often I have to consciously walk, step. I'm in Christ, Lord, thank you. I'm in Christ, Lord, thank you. I'm in Christ, Lord, thank you. Because it's important to realize this, that I say walk by the Spirit or in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The good news is if you walk in the Spirit, you won't carry out the desires of the flesh because supernaturally, Jesus will lift you up above the pull of the virus. The bad news is there's a virus still in you. And this flesh does desire. Right? So never feel guilty again that there's desires in you to get, as there's a desire that rises up to get angry, to get frustrated, to get impatient, or whatever, ever, ever. I know in the King James it's, it's translated lust, but that word just means strong desire. And one of the real disciplines of the Christian life, the most important discipline of the Christian life, is remembering that I'm, that renewing my mind, this great discipline of step by step, walking one step at a time, when I'm in Christ, I'm utterly dependent on the Holy Spirit to produce the righteousness of Christ in that situation. I've acknowledged it's his story, not my story. It's not my life, it's his life. If Christ is my life, which... Pat was a member of the church one time called Christ Your Life Fellowship. That's from Colossians 3. If Christ is your life, it means your life story is not his life story. You don't have any rights. But walking in that, when the flesh is trying to pull you into saying you do have a right, you have a right to not be disturbed, you have a right to not be bothered, you have a right to not do this, you have a right. You know what I'm saying? I hope you do, I'm I feel like I'm just, this is a time of personal confession. These guys are all my things of absolution. No. And so theologically, this encourages me, reminds me of truth. There is a law of sin in my flesh, and this is like, it's two minutes to seven, so I think we've done some productive stalling. Enough to, like, next week, we'll, I want to show you some stuff in Romans 7. I think it's really powerful. But the fact is that I still have this fallen humanity. And there's a law of sin. Now, Jesus wants to manifest himself through my mortal flesh, according to 2 Corinthians 4. But there's a law of sin in my flesh. I'm not evil, but there's an evil principle in my flesh. And it does desire. It wants to control me. So he says in the very next verse, he says, For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another 
so that you may not do the things that you please. Now hear this, hear this, hear this. As a new creation, you have a new heart whose basic desires is for righteousness. So he says, the flesh is desiring against the spirit, and the spirit's desiring against the flesh, and they're in opposition with each other to keep you from doing what you please, what you wish. In other words, you, the real you in Christ, really wants to do the right thing. You want to please God. In my early Christian life, I was always told I was just basically a sinner still, just a worm, and I had no, you know, there was nothing good in me. Well, there's nothing good in my flesh. It's law of sin, but Christ wants to manifest himself in my flesh, and I have a new heart, and my new heart is full of righteous desire, but also I'm attached to a new life, a new power. The life of Christ doesn't just give me a new heart. I'm also infused with a new power, his ability by the Spirit. So I'll just walk in the Spirit to live in righteousness. Amen. To manifest his righteousness. And when he says here, the Spirit in opposition to the flesh, here's the thing that we do know. The flesh can be very, its desires can be very strong, can it? The desire to get frustrated, to get angry, to get your feelings hurt, to feel sorry for yourself. You boom, boom, boom. All right? All those things. Um, But, and he's in opposition with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is much stronger than the flesh. Amen? The, God, the Holy Spirit, is stronger than the flesh. And so if we'll walk in the Spirit, he'll put the flesh down every single time. Doesn't mean there won't be some thoughts, there won't be some temptation, but the Holy Spirit will put him down every time. If step by step we just go, I'm in Christ. Just abiding, remembering that Christ has already conquered this thing in you, and you're just thanking him for being your victory in that moment. Or thank you for you are my victory over this. You know, I just I think I'm in Christ. That says all that to me. I'm reaffirming my surrender. I'm reaffirming my confidence that he's my victory. I'm reaffirming all those things in that little statement. The Holy Spirit will always overcome the flesh. Because even though they're in opposition, they're not equals. So, the desire and the capacity for holiness in you is actually much, much stronger than the desire and the capacity for sin in you. You with me? You and I sin by choice, not by nature. Because you're in union with Christ. And so the desire and the capacity to live a holy life in this moment is much stronger and more powerful than the desire of the flesh. Now, if you've established a pattern, the enemy will lie to you and say, I, well, I just can't get free from this. You've already been set free from it. And just walk it out. All right, you can stop. We'll pick that up next time, okay? I actually didn't stall. That's about as far as I was going to get no matter what. So... Well, you know what? The truth sets us free. As long as you and I think you're basically a sinner and the strongest desire and strongest power in you is to, is to sin, then you're going to keep doing it. But the Spirit's in opposition against the flesh and the Holy Spirit, God, is more stronger than the law of sin. That's the real you. The real you is the one who desires to walk in holiness, and the greatest power in you is the power, his power, to walk in that. But we have to, what do we have to do? Try harder? No. Walk in spirit. One step. One temptation at a time. One desire of the flesh at a time. Amen? Well, Father, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. It's so simple. God, Jesus said it's perfect. <laughs> you made it so simple. We want to make it so hard, so complicated. Lord, we want to add to what you said is perfect, Lord. And if we add anything to what you said is perfect, then we're saying it wasn't perfect. Only by adding something can we make it perfect. We're denying the cross. So, Lord, cause this word to bear fruit hundredfold in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Okie doke. Well, thanks for coming out, y'all.
Yes, ma'am. I'm glad to be here. 